Right, everybody, thank you for coming. Um, so, it's a pleasure today to welcome Jeremy Leggett, all the way from the UK, who's going to give the seminar, the speech seminar today. Uh, I had the first had the pleasure of listening to Jeremy present, it's probably seven years ago now, in the UK, at a solar, UK Solar ISIS conference. Um, and since then, I've been following you on Twitter, I've been reading your articles in The Guardian, uh, and, you know, it, I've always been amazed by the, the, the breadth and, and depth of your work. Um, Jeremy is a kind of modern-day polymath of the renewable energy industry. So I say he's an uh, academic, but uh, uh, he runs a company. <laughs> he runs a charity, or is a big into charity. He's also an activist at heart. And, as you may in indicate later, he's also a, an anorak. In, and clearly has got uh, knowledge of a, a very broad remit of things that are going on in the renewable energy industry and in the, what you're going to call the, the, the carbon war. Um, so, you know, sit back and enjoy and, and welcome Jeremy. Thanks. Yeah, and, and let me add my thanks to you for giving up a lunchtime on such a beautiful day. You know, when I think what the weather's like back home in the UK, it's always a wonder to me that anyone ever gets any work done on this campus, but there we are. Um, so the brief is to talk about what I think of as the carbon war. Um, I get criticized for maybe having had too many toy soldiers when I was a small boy, undoubtedly true, but it feels like a war to me, a civil war. And the argument I'm gonna try and persuade you of, if you need persuading, is that since middle of 2013, we who long to see a clean energy future and abated climate change and air quality and all the rest of it um, have begun to, won, uh, to win. We haven't won yet, uh, and we may not, but it's a process. The tide of, of the struggle has turned in those years. And this little book that I wrote, which you can download for free, um, a digital version of um, argues that these were the turnaround years and it's a told in linear narrative goes through to the last night of the Paris Climate Summit and I think this analysis that I'm going to present continues into 2016 notwithstanding recent events in America um, and there are three themes or meta narratives in the saga I think the first one is that we're dealing with a global society that is beginning to awaken to the threat of climate change um, as a potentially existential threat in critical mass. I mean, obviously not everybody, not 47% um, of the United States, but a, a critical mass of people have got this now. Um, secondly, we, the insurgency, that's what they call us, lumping us in with the Taliban. So we, the insurgency, are um, disrupting the energy incumbency incredibly fast, much faster than most people, most lay people, uh, pick up from media coverage of what's going on. Finally, and you know, unrelatedly in many ways, the energy uh, incumbency is facing multiple threats and they're increasingly existential and they don't necessarily have to do with climate change and we, the insurgency. They're, they're kind of manifestations of aging industries working on frontiers. So the core argument, in case I run out of time, um, is, uh, you know, basically, no one of these meta-narratives would be enough on its own, but all three of them, working in parallel, are incredibly potent, and that's why we've started to win the carbon war. But I thought, you know, um, it will be interesting to you to offer a brief personal perspective before I sort of zip into the global one. Um, and so I do the talk in two parts uh, and sort of give you an account of what it looks like and feels like from where someone like me sits uh, on the front lines. Just, you know, a bit part player in a global drama, but in enough, of, enough places to kind of see what's going on and be able to chronicle what's going on the way I do in the book and on my website. So personal perspective, I have three phases to my career. For the first phase, I was a creature of the oil and gas industry. I was on the faculty at the Royal School of Mines um, in Imperial College. I was a geologist. You know, if anyone had ever said to me, you'll wind up in a solar company, I'd have, I'd have said, what's a solar company? 
Um, and so that's exploring for oil in the 1980s in Baluchistan. Um, but my research was on geological oceanography, so I kind of got worried about climate change early before it was, as it were, fashionable. And I left that world, just walked out on it overnight and, and became uh, an environmental campaigner with Greenpeace International for six or seven years working just on climate change. So I saw the whole of the climate negotiations through to the Kyoto Protocol in 97. And at the end of that phase, I, you know, I, I came to the view that the business world was going to be so important in this, not uh, on its own, but you know, governments wouldn't be able to do it unless there was a critical mass of people in business pushing with them. So um, a number of my friends, including the people who originally backed Solar Century, the company I set up um, at the end of the last century, uh, said, you know, it's not rocket science. Why don't you have a crack at it yourself? So I set up the company as a non-violent direct action in the capital markets. Now, my venture capital investors hate it when I talk like that, but that's how I see it. And that's how many of the um, people who've worked at Solar Century s see it and, and still do. And all along the way, I've kind of uh, scribbled about the experiences because, as Darren said, I like to scribble. And um, I've written a, a couple of books. So really, what you're hearing about today is the sequel to the carbon war that went from the very beginning when governments started to negotiate through to the Kyoto Climate Summit. So let's start with Solar Century, just a few slides on Solar Century. We're kind of, you can think of the, this company as a kind of, if you don't know it, as a sort of hopefully healthy middleweight downstream company. We're not one of the multi-billion dollar Silicon Valley rock stars, but you know, we're a multi-hundred million um, middleweight and we're active in nine countries now uh, across the world, in Europe, Africa uh, and Latin America. And we're 16 years old and we've lived right the way through this spectacular explosion that you all know about since 2006, the way it's built up with the cost down of solar and then just sort of erupted on the world um, since 2006, the tipping point, seven doublings since the year 2000. That's, that's remarkable growth. Nobody got that right. Even the best of the enthusiasts, the biggest of the enthusiasts, uh, undershot in what actually happened. So coincidentally, the company, um, in terms of what it's installed, has actually more than uh, doubled seven times across that period. I wish I could say the same about the profits, but that's the solar installed. And um, we, we do everything from solar farms to commercial roofs and industrial roofs all across the downstream space. Uh, but we're particularly fond of the residential area and that's where we've chosen to innovate. innovate. We've had an innovation team all the way through our history. And we've had a series, um, a, a sort of catalog of solar slates and roof tiles and bespoke elements of the built environment. The latest one is this, if you have a look on the website, it's called Sun Station. Um, and it's neat because it, uh, it is for the first time giving a building integrated mega slate that you can install on residential properties for pretty much the same price as bolt-on modules. So as far as we're aware, it's a first and it's all click and plug and play and minimum number of components and a minimum amount of time on the roof. So uh, you know uh, what's it like in the solar industry. It's a survivor's game. Most of you will know this industry is an absolute bloodbath despite that spectacular success. M me, for example, most everybody I know from the origins of the company and through the history of it has gone bankrupt. Uh, and very few people have made any money at all. Um, you know, and it, some economists might choose to say, well, look, mate, it's capitalism. This is what happens. It's called creative destruction. To which I say, yeah, I know all about that. But you know, a heck of a, a lot of it is to do with enemy action as well. Ambush attacks on tariff regimes, people setting up business plans in good faith and then having the legs chopped off from underneath them by governments who succumb to incumbency lobbying along the way. So that's, that's, where, um, that's what it feels like to me. And it's worth being a survivor 
because, you know, if you can survive through to just a few years from now, you will know what's coming. Bloomberg, for example, saying by 2020, most every country, onshore wind and solar are going to be cheaper than anything else you can get your energy from. And um, that will be a very fertile space indeed, especially when you map on all the other stuff that I'll talk about in the global context to do with storage and smart energy of all kinds. So hanging on is vital for a few more years and hopefully we'll be able to do that. There's one other way that we've tried to be, you know, a bit different apart from the innovation and that is uh, the philanthropy. So we give away 5% of our profits and um, at the risk of sounding a bit pious, you know, I, I really wish more companies would do this because you don't miss it and it's a great investment because of what you can do with the 5% in terms of uh, culture and morale um, in, in the team. So what we did was set up this charity, SolarAid, when we were eventually profitable in 2006. Um, and ever since we've given 5% of the profits, le leveraged in other stuff, and we build solar lighting markets in Africa. And this is a heck of a lot of fun and, you know, really wonderful to do because each one of these little lights knocks out a kerosene lantern. And when you do that, you're saving a shed load of money on the kerosene. We know how much, we, we follow up in the field, we do loads of surveys. It's an average of $70 per household. And we've sold 1.8 million of these things so far since uh, the charity began. Each of them also saves a ton of carbon dioxide. It seems incredible, doesn't it? One little light, but that over its lifetime, that's what it saves in burning kerosene in the lantern. Um, and, you know, uh, unlike the main market, uh, what, no, sorry, like the main market, the um, solar lighting market has, has really taken off in Africa. And, you know, we, we had, we were lucky enough to be able to have quite a lot to do with that. We sold 1.8 million, as I said, we started at $25 an item. Um, we're now down to five. So it's a, again a, a mirror of what's happening in the big market with mega solar. Um, and we catalyzed the first two proper lighting markets in Tanzania and Kenya. Um, and we're still active in three, Zambia, Uganda and Malawi, where, which we haven't succeeded in catalyzing yet, but you know, we're trying to lead the way. And the prize here is really big for development. I mean, mobile phones, anyone, anyone who's been to Africa will know mobile phones are everywhere. And if you plot the penetration of that product into the market over the year of, um, since inter introduction, you get that curve. And, um, you know, on a log scale, uh, solar lighting is sort of emulating the bottom part of the curve. So big prize if we can just, and other companies can just keep this going. Big development prize, and it's an energy ladder prize because though we know what they do with those savings, those $70, and it's buying seeds, school books, medicines, and it's also buying bigger solar lights when they've got enough saved. And with the bigger solar lights, you can do things like plug in mobile phones, and then you can rent your piece of kit to your neighbor so they don't have to cycle 10 miles to charge their phone. And you've got micro enterprise and you've got, you know, the energy ladder. Um, so that's all in microcosm of what um, has to happen on the global stage and I think is happening. So the rest of the talk I'll talk about global and you will know we're part of this, everyone here I'm sure. Um, we're on some sort of voyage from the road on the left, artist's impression, to the road on the right, or some versions of them. And you can come at this as an academic, you know, laden with stats. Uh, I, I was an academic, I, I could do all that. Uh, you can come at it as a business person and talk just in dreary business jargon. But, you know, uh, given how much we love stories, and I love stories and love writing, and there's an alternative view, and that is linear narrative. This is just one heck of a drama. And it has these three um, meta-narratives, as I said at the outset. So in the rest of the talk, let me um, go through these three and tell you what I think are the top dozen stories. Others may disagree here, and it's not just a question of 12, 
but they're all going across the arc of the narrative. They're all interrelated. They're all feeding off each other. And each and every one of them is a huge drama, I think. So let's start with global society awakening. Uh, you can think of this as a kind of survival reflex, really, a collective humankind survival reflex. Um, governments, let's start with them. They're getting serious in the last few years in a way that they never did before in the quarter of the century that um, they've been talking about climate change, mostly talking, not doing. And we first saw how um, far they intended to go, at least the front runners intended to go, in June of 2015, front page of the Financial Times, you know, at the G7 summit, we're going to get rid of fossil fuels this century. And I think even more impressive, 70% cuts by 2050. This is a reflection of what they're being told, obviously, by, their, by the scientific communities. So this was led by um, Merkel, Obama, and Hollande. But you know, they dragged the other four. The other four are all foot draggers, including our then PM Cameron. Um, drag them along with them. Uh, but the doubters said, going into Paris, the climate summit in December 2015, now that this is going to happen. It will be like Copenhagen. Um, governments are not going to deal with this problem ever. Uh, so, you know, the chances of a clear signal were deemed low by all the conoscenti and, frankly, a lot of the advocates as well. What we got was the clearest possible signal. This is the decarbonisation treaty. It is cleverly drafted. It's not perfect. It doesn't deliver the job straight away, but it delivers a legally binding ratchet mechanism that can get us there if we keep going with recent developments. And every single independent nation on the planet, including North Korea, signed, adopted this thing in Paris. Many of these nations are at war with each other, or proxy war. But, you know, you, I find it really kind of encouraging that they can put all that aside and put up uh, glass walls and say, you know, we face a common threat, let's do something about it. But the doubters said, well, look, they just got carried away and it won't be signed and ratified by enough people. Um, and it has been. It was um, ratified uh, by the requisite number and came into force on the 4th of November. And, you know, the, the US, the Obama administration and the Chinese have a lot um, of credit in this process. They really led it, they drove it, they played like a tag team, despite all the differences, you know, all the things they disagree on. They played like a tag team from late 2014 onwards. But you know, every uh, good drama needs uh, reversals of fortune. Um, five days after this treaty came into force, government scrambling to get it into force before the US election, just in case. And the just in case um, nightmare happened. Uh, so, you know, any of the foot draggers, any country, the Saudi Arabias, the, the Japans, the people of a long track, the Canadas, uh, the, the Australias, of course, uh, have a long track record of being obstructive in this process. Any of them could have said, uh, no, this, this is it. We're, the, we, we got overexcited in Paris. It's not going to happen. So what was the outcome of their annual climate summit in Marrakesh? Um, every single nation there, including Saudi Arabia and all the rest, signed a declaration. If you haven't read this, I really recommend it. They talk about a, a, an irreversible process, an urgent duty in the face of what they have to do. They, and basically the message was to Mr. Trump, you back out of this thing, fella, and you're going to be a rogue state in a minority of one, and we're going to do it without you. So also encouraging. And then the, the big thing that's changed is the role of business. So 306, whoever cobbled this together in a few days deserves congratulations. I don't know who it was. 360 American businesses signed a kick-ass statement saying, you know, you'll undermine American prosperity if you turn your back on this kind of thing with brands like DuPont, Hewlett Packard, all the rest. Extraordinary. And it's not just about climate change. As we all know, it's about air pollution, the number one killer in the world, uh, according to the World Health Organization's latest, I mean, horror stories now um, emerging. India just the other day declaring a state of emergency. They can't even measure the PM2.5s. The, the instruments aren't calibrated to go high enough. 
Um, and in China, you know, same thing. Cities just drowning in smog and real public concern. So latest opinion poll, 92% of Chinese people will happily pay more for green energy because their kids are going to school like this every day. And that government is going to listen to this. The, you know, there's a whole political text here about how the government has to listen to its people even though China's not a democracy. And then on top of this, corporate malfeasance, the Volkswagen scandal. So you've got, you know, um, corporate entities like Renault saying, this is game over for diesel. It's in the end game. A whole category of oil is on the way out and it will be out sooner than we know it. Now, none of this could have happened without civil society um, increasingly getting engaged, campaigning right across the piece. And that has happened in states, cities, companies, churches, communities all over the world. And very little of this makes the ABC or the BBC uh, or any of the main media outlets. But when you look at the drama, the little pieces of drama that emerge every day, it's such a compelling picture. We we'll start with the states, led by California, um, targets better than many governments, and the officials in California have said, if the US pulls out, we're the sixth biggest economy in the world, and we will think about applying to join the treaty in, uh, as a proxy for the United States of America. Thousand cities have committed to 100% renewable power, some like Canberra, as soon as 2020. Um, 16 U.S. cities, so, you know, this is a genuinely international thing. Four of them, smaller American cities, have already achieved the target. Fifty major corporations by the time of the Paris summit, it's now more than 80, committed to 100% renewables. And I think, you know, those of us who study the models for 100% renewables, um, you know, this is very interesting, I think, because... Businesses on the whole, big brands, do not sign up to 100% of anything unless they're 110% certain that it can be done. So we should all be hugely encouraged by this. IKEA, Hewlett Packard, as soon as 2020, 600 multinationals are now uh, factoring the Paris Agreement into their business plans. And a load of money is involved in this. You know, increasingly people see, as they said in that letter to Trump, this is about future prosperity. We're not going to get it with fossil fuels. We will with this stuff. Investors in the hundreds of billions are lining up to say, we're going to pressure companies to get involved in this 100% thing. And then there's the ethical component, the churches, led by the Catholics and the Pope in that wonderful encyclical, very impactful in June, but not just the Catholics, the Protestant denominations, um, Buddhists, uh, and a very important meeting of Islamic leaders saying much the same thing. You can see them all beginning to compete with each other, the religions. It's uh, vaguely wonderful. And of course, there's a massive uh, poverty alleviation spin to all this as well. Communities, thousands of community projects all across the world in wind, solar, and other things. Um, and in Germany, more than, as you may know, more than half the renewable infrastructure is owned by communities and individuals. And pan-political support. You know, in California, more Republicans than Democrats have solar roofs. This is one little nugget I learned the other day. Read it in The Guardian. Must be true. And, um, you know, in the, 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 the latest opinion poll shows that, you know, in my own country, conservatives uh, are just as keen on this as everybody else. Third story is arguably the most important one. It's about re regulators beginning to regulate climate risk. And this is really new. It only happened um, in 2015. Uh, and this has to do with the famous carbon bubble, described, among others, by Carbon Tracker, a financial think tank that I'm lucky enough to chair. And you will, I'm sure, know the idea here. That is, if we want to keep global warming below two degrees, most of the fossil, the proven fossil fuel reserves have to stay in the ground. So the rest is nominally unburnable if governments do what they promise to do, and at minimum is in danger of becoming a stranded asset. So this is a, a simple argument, but just couched in the terms of the capital markets in language that investors can understand. Um, 
and this has now been taken up by the regulators. It wasn't initially, but the Bank of England is now really on this case, and the governor, in a famous speech in September, said, you know, this is the biggest issue for the future. It's a threat to capital markets, and what has to happen? Investors have to be given the data to invest accordingly. Now, um, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to work out what that means. It means get your money out of fossil fuels and into the clean stuff as in, a, in as orderly a manner as you can do it. And this isn't just a British regulatory thing, it's a G20 thing, so Australia's involved. The G20's Financial Stability Board, responsible for the stability of the capital markets, set up a task force on these disclosures that will be needed for investors, chaired by none other than Michael Bloomberg. It reports next week, its first report comes out, and that's gonna be watched by many financial institutions. Some actors are already um, seeing the writing on the wall and acting. The ratings agencies, Moody's, for example, factoring Paris into credit assessments for companies, and companies jumping before they're pushed. So Suncor is the biggest producer in the tar sands, has been talking to the Canadian government for permission um, and some kind of compensation, of course, for deliberately stranding some of its tar sands reserves. So watch this story if you're not following it. It's such a drama. This is the one that could really turn the tide because if there's a tipping point in money um, moving away from fossil fuels and into the clean stuff, then we really will be getting somewhere. Well, that's already begun to happen at the level of the divestment campaign that's been going on uh, since 2012. Uh, Bill McKibben picking up on Carbon Tracker's work, talking about the terrifying math of the carbon bubble. And by the time of the Paris Climate Summit, you know, more than 500 institutions worth more than $3 trillion divested from fossil fuels at some level or totally, or having promised to do so. And that, that was right across society. Um, different kinds of institutions, including, of course, pension funds, universities, obviously lots of student campaigning on this, and um, professional in institutions, such as the British Medical Association, um, effectively saying through their divestment, you know what, fossil fuel equals tobacco in the eyes of us, the doctors. And imagine if you're working for a fossil fuel company and you wake up and you read that. I have a very good friend working for one of the companies and she said to me that uh, she's got teenage kids and one of them picked this up and you know, parroted it at her across the breakfast table. She said, Jeremy, can you imagine what I felt like? And I, at that point, you know, sometimes in life you have to shut up, don't you? And the, and the pension fund's doing remarkable things. Uh, the um, Swedish state pension fund, AP4, uh, not only divesting its massive equity portfolio, but reinvesting on the other side. So they're beginning to see the connection. It's not just a question, let's pull out of fossil fuels and go to medical or whatever. It's, there, ha there has to be a reason for this. So the second theme is, we the insurgency disrupting the incumbency. This one you all know about, we're going exponential, solar and wind. It's worth looking at that wonderful diagram. You, there's nothing proprietary here, so if anyone wants to nick the slides, just you can get them off this computer or from somebody. It's worth doing it in slow motion because it's so enjoyable to watch. <laughs> <laughs> and this one's good as well. 40 years of pricing in energy. Um, indices for the fossil fuels, coal, oil and gas, doesn't matter what they are. Um, the point is that they're generally cheap for a very long period. We're, solar wouldn't have appeared on this page until 2006, and then this is what happened to the average price of installation in um, normalized prices. That, um, and analysts have called it the terror dome because it resembles a fairground ride, but also because it's gonna strike a bit of terror into the heart of anyone who wants to defend the status quo, come what may. And so as a result of this, you know, there are more jobs in US solar, for example, than in either coal or oil and gas extraction. It's the same in wind, the auctions that we keep not breaking record prices on in solar um, are mirrored in wind. Uh, and here's 
the one in July of uh, 2016, Dong Energy winning at 70 megawatts, uh, 70 euros a megawatt hour, uh, and that was broken uh, just a couple of weeks later in another auction. So you do wonder how many lay people, because of the media coverage or rather non-coverage of this thing, or the preference of many media outlets just to print knocking copy. In the UK, 80% of the media coverage of renewables is negative. It's put there, of course, by PR agencies on the payroll of, of the incumbency. But can you imagine 80% negative? Um, who would know that renewables have overtaken coal as the world's largest source of power capacity? Who would know that you know, their entire countries um, getting 100% of their renewables now, today, uh, on a, a daily basis. Who would know that China last year, um, in its introduction of new electrical capacity, only used wind and solar? Or that, you know, enormous giants of the corporate world are clearly positioning to morph into some kind of weird digital energy company. Apple's created uh, its own energy company in June this year, uh, got all its um, regulatory approvals, and has already invested well over a billion dollars. So have the others. And at this point, of course, you will know it's not just about the renewables, it's about batteries and EVs. And same story, you know, the price down of lithium batteries, pretty impressive, conservative Bloomberg view off into the future, and the growth of electric vehicles in consequence. That's 60% growth to get to that point. That's what they're projecting. Um, and the existing rate of expansion is pretty much the same as the Model T in, in 100 years ago. Only two million of them, million of them at the road, you know, on the roads at the moment, but rising fast and likely to accelerate because at the Paris Motor Show in October, every single auto company took turns to introduce their new electric model. And for those of you who aspire to become chief executives after you finish here at, uh, at uni, note the required dress sense. <laughs> So the famous Mercedes-Benz logo now appearing on residential batteries as well as cars. Sadly, looking a bit like a rubbish bin, but I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure it won't be um, given its potency. And, and again, setting up an energy company, a car company setting up an energy company, you, you can see what's coming. All these things will be hooked in together. And it doesn't take much to really disrupt things. So this is a fascinating, uh, study by Bloomberg analysts of um, what you need to do to displace oil. And suddenly, somehow, oh no, okay, uh, it just got stuck for a minute. So um, here's the projected uh, rise of, of EVs in the world. This is an interesting level, two million barrels a day of displacement by, of oil by electric vehicles. That's a rather crucial sort of um, ceiling because at that, that's the point when there's two million barrels a day of surplus oil sloshing around, that's the point that historically the price has really tended to tank, uh, causing great problems for the oil industry. Well, wh when does that happen on projected growth rates of electric vehicles? Why? By 2023. So in that analysis, there's going to be a low oil price environment for quite a long time. Others, of course, have a different analysis, but uh, that's one Bloomberg one. And, and people are sort of noticing what's coming in remarkable places, all sorts of examples of this. But in Abu Dhabi in January, the um, crown prince saying to his people, you know, we're going to be out of oil in 50 years. Uh, and you're not going to be sad because of what we'll have invested in in the, in, in the interim, all this new 21st century stuff. We already have electric vehicle Grand Prix racing, and the pace of innovation there is so fast, it's getting people overexcited. So Richard Branson says, you know, maybe 10 years, it'll all be over. We won't be smelling petrol fumes any longer. And you say, Richard, you know, what have, what have you been s smoking? But... Um, but it has happened before. You know, this is Fifth Avenue in New York. Can't spot uh, anything but horse-drawn carriages in uh, 1900. 13 years later, you can't spot anything but cars. So is, that, 
thing been up there all the time I've been talking? They, they wonder what's happened. Have I, I've done something stupid, probably, is the answer, because it's not showing here. Um, okay, right, good. Um, and all this is before the megadata revolution has seriously overlain on our world. Uh, this is really exciting because, you know, we, as, as you know from reading anything on the business pages, any number of companies have gone from garages in Silicon Valley to multi-billion dollar market caps in just a few years using megadata in different ways and with different strategies. And I won't go through them, they're all kind of, they become household names. Doing things like leveraging other people's assets and other people's workforces, you know, all this has really barely started to overlay on our world. And it's going to, it's going too fast uh, and that world is ready for it. The other day in the UK, National Grid transmitted massive amounts of data down the electricity wires in the, in the national grid. So very exciting. The final uh, few stories are the third and final meta-narrative or theme, and that's the incumbency's problem. Uh, problems, catalog of problems. And this is always the piece where I have to fight really hard to keep the schadenfreude off my face. Um, utilities are racing to escape a death spiral by their own admission in multiple countries. In Europe, um, E.ON was the first to chuck a U.E., as you say in Australia, um, away from fossil fuels and to the clean energy future. This is the, how they're going to get their prosperity. And good luck to them. I hope they succeed. Very difficult with that sort of corporate culture. But, and one by one, all the others pretty much have gone the same way. Even GDF Suez, who would have thought that? This is a killer gas company that until a few weeks before it took that decision was lobbying to have every renewable subsidy shut down in Europe because of the damage that we were doing to the gas industry. And gas was going to be the future. Um, everything was going to be done with gas, including cutting greenhouse gas emissions despite the um, leakage rates. But now it's a different story. And it's not just the um, insurgency and the climate driver it's clean air and you know the, the collapse of coal. And you'll be aware, I've no doubt, that many analysts um, look at what's going on in coal and say, this is not cyclical. This is structural. And this is vitally important for the Australian economy to, um, uh, to you know, take a view on this. Because if it indeed is structural, then th there has to be a PDQ retreat strategy. And so analysts like uh, those at Goldman Sachs now say, it's, this is terminal. It's on the way out. It's in an end game. Um, of course, you don't always want to believe everything you're told by investment bankers. But um, when it suits your argument, it's OK. <laughs> so uh, utilities are doing obvious things. They're you know, buying assets in the, in the downstream, uh, like the large German downstream company, Belectric RWE, one of Eon's competitors. Um, and f financial sector people are saying, you, you know, whatever you do, whether you go with fossil fuels, bad idea, but, um, or renewables, it's going to be roughly the same. You, you're talking a couple of hundred million to do what needs to be done. And the, the financial institutions are saying, we know where we want you to go now, even Barclays. So um, the final story is of oil and gas uh, entering its twilight years. And many people, when you say that to them, say, what are you talking about? This is the most powerful industry in the world. Well, you don't even need to be um, sitting where I am to have this view. This is a headline from the Financial Times as they survey the problems of the industry. Much of it has got to do with an industry that is binging on debt. And here, we're using the words of a headline in the Wall Street Journal, and you can see in that chart how the debt has built up spectacularly since the oil price uh, began to fall in 2014 in the four biggest companies. They combined have $184 billion in debt, uh, and they're spending more than 100% of any profits they make on dividends, giving the money back to shareholders. This is not a sustainable business model. 
Um, no wonder people talk of twilight. The debt mountain for the international oil and gas industry by 2014 was three trillion. It'll be quite a bit more than that now. And analysts who have long supported the industry are beginning to now um, echo that headline in the Financial Times. Indeed, that's what it was based on, their kinds of opinions. So Fadel Gate at Oppenheimer and Co. This industry cannot survive on current oil prices, talking uh, of doomsday markets. Um, then you've got the demographics. They've been firing a lot of people since 2014, 350,000 and counting to be precise. 60% of the fracking workforce has been laid off, um, a few creeping back now. 70% uh, of the fracking equipment idled. This is a real problem. And then as you look at the age of the researchers and uh, faculty here and compare yourselves, uh, and in tech companies, and compare yourselves to oil and gas, you know the average age in the oil and gas industry, including the graduates that they hire, is 49. And the average retirement age is 55. This is a literal, uh, an industry that is literally fading away on its feet. Its track record of delivering large projects, BP, just in the news this morning, have allocated $9 billion to a very appropriately named um, deep water oil project in the Gulf of Mexico, Mad Dog 2. Uh, what's the betting that there will be any return for the pension funds who are funding that when you look at the track record of these mega projects. Ernst & Young um, have done a survey of 365 of the biggest, and I've chosen an Australian one here, a particular white elephant. But you know, the majority of them have huge cost overruns and are miles behind schedule. And if you're the executive director of the International Energy Agency, you think very, very carefully before saying something like this, but this message could not be clearer. Um, fossil fuel investments are taking a nosedive. Anyone who does not understand what is going on, be they governments, companies, markets, is not in the right place. So um, what are they doing? Um, hedging risk in some cases. Statoil has set up a renewable energy division. None of them have done what the utilities um, have been doing and Chaka Yui, but they're hedging the bet. So Statoil uh, have put some serious executives into this renewable energy division as of 2015. They're doing a great job with uh, floating wind offshore, which is a great way to value engineer um, projects. Uh, and of course, play to the leveraging of oil industry technical assets, really smart stuff. Others have dug in and, you know, are doggedly trying to defend the status quo. There's a big, I think there's a big cultural problem here. You know, men of a certain age finding it very, very difficult to shift out of their belief system. So Shell heads off to the Arctic to drill for oil at an oil price of $64 a barrel. Very, very doubtful whether they can make any profit at all or even cover their costs at $64 a barrel. Great business model, eh? Uh, and of course, half the population of Seattle in kayaks don't want them to do it. And then in September, the inevitable, they don't find any oil. Even if they had, the oil price then is down to $46 a barrel. They would just be used, losing money by the shed load had they found any and started to produce it. And they would have been praying that the oil price would come back up again, of course. But if it comes back too high, you know, that's the global economy on its knees. So great, very sustainable. Um, and then finally, the, uh, the shale boom, which is sort of part of this story. In 2011, um, we were told on the front cover of Time magazine, this was the rock that could power the world. But by 2014, even at high oil prices north of $100, Bloomberg was saying, you know, is this boom going bust? And then a bit later, June 2015, um, the oil prices dropped. Uh, this is not looking good. The shale industry could be swallowed by its own debt. Um, 100 oil and gas companies have gone bankrupt in the shale. Small and medium-sized ones, none of the big ones um, as a result of that. But, but this is because of banks recalling the, uh, the debts. And... Economists who, you know, study economies on paper 
have a tendency to say, well, this is all overblown, the oil price will go back up again, it will be cyclical, they will start saying money, uh, they will start um, making money again. But their own leaders are saying to them, you know, it's not like turning the, the light back on, the kit rusts, uh, when it's mothballed, it, uh, it gets cannibalized, and your workers go and work for the solar industry. Headline in the Wall Street Journal. Definitely a schadenfreude moment. Then they have their environment problems. You know, countries are banning this. Uh, Germany recently, because, you know, uh, the deciding argument was, crikey, there's a risk that all those toxins could get into the water with which we brew German beer. <laughs> end, end of discussion. But Scotland, you know, Scotland was one of the recent ones, and that story continues too. So I've finished now. Um, you know, that, that hopefully is a bit of a cautiously optimistic story that I've been spinning you. Um, of course, yeah, it's a race against time. Um, I don't even like talking about the climate science these days. It's just a tad too depressing. And this um, is just the one slide to make the point. It's the, the copy of the text of the Paris Agreement. It's got a handwritten note on it. Uh, it was written by President Obama, probably the most briefed world leader in the world on all this, uh, to his team. And it says, thanks very much uh, to the Paris team you've given future generations a fighting chance. That's a really interesting choice of words. Not, you know, you've cracked this thing, we're on the, we're on the way now. You've given future generations a fighting chance. And I think we all know what's in his mind when he says that. So, race against time. Few conclusions. Um, absent geopolitical earthquakes, uh, you know, uh, these three megatrends are going to mutually reinforce. And we're all going to have a lot of fun and uh, very worthwhile careers. Solar is going to be in the heart of the action. Um, those who prosper, obviously, are going to have to, it's not just about solar, it's about all the interfaces with everything else, particularly the, the digital frontiers. And they're just going to be huge opportunities in riding the wave, energy independence, all the rest of it, the prescription for renaissance. But real life picture, shark in the wave below the, the dolphin, you know, enormous threats, goes without saying. Um, and those with vision who can move fast and are best placed, will be best placed to prosper um, and protect civilization. Increasingly, these things, I think, are going to be synonymous. And I'm sure many of you in this room, if not all of you, are going to be part of this process. And I thank you again for listening and more strength to your arm. These are my contact points if you have any other questions um, or want to check the website. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions? It was quiet at this moment. <laughs> Confidence finally, Jeremy chips in. Um, thank you very much for your talk. That, that was terrific. Um, just two quick things. Firstly, um, what do you think? Do you, do you think it's how politically risky do you think it is, for instance, to uh, roll in uh, sort of uh, poverty eradication goals with, with solar goals? I mean, it, it's obviously a great thing to do in, in, in so many ways. Um, but, but some people, some people you know, don't, don't like renewable energy, etc. And, and combining that with not liking reducing poverty as well, sometimes that's bad. And, and just very quickly, um, like, if you could remove one single barrier to this transition, what, what sort of thing would it be? Yeah, um, okay, let me start with that one because that's, that's too difficult. I mean, it's, it's like saying, what is the single most important piece of, um, energy technology and big, you, you know, we all know it's a massive portfolio answer, right? There's no magic solution. So that's, I think that applies uh, to what we would need to shift. I mean, I, I, I guess the means of communication, the, co the control, multiple countries, the media is a huge problem with, with, with this. I think that's one, maybe one thing, but it's certainly not the answer. But if you take the BBC and the ABC, you, you know, the, the, I know a lot about the BBC, much less about the ABC, but I know enough and I have enough mates out here to uh, hear that it's very similar. And the BBC's perfor performance is just awful. 
on all this. It's as though it's impolite to even talk about, about any, any of this. So that it would somehow, we need to get round that. Um, and then on the development question, well, look, uh, yeah, you know, maybe in our countries, because um, that's, you, you would need to sell it on other arguments, but it, this is an international struggle. And certainly where um, I operate in Africa, most of the governments in those countries have no other choice. I mean, coal and wires are not going to do it for them. They um, very clearly, and even the World Bank is telling them that. So uh, d development and pov poverty all alleviation is vitally important. China and India as well, with their r rural populations, particularly India, and the, you know, the way we have to deconstruct Indian coal use. Um, I, I think that it's, um, it's a very potent argument, and things are not far from hopeless in India. They have these massive solar targets, as you may know, I mean, 100 gigawatts of of solar targeted in different domains. So, um, yeah, I think the poverty alleviation argument is important to deploy on the global whole. And of course, um, all these governments that have, have done so relatively well in the multilateral forum of, um, of climate in the last few years, they also signed off on the 17 sustainable development goals. Um, I think the majority of them at any rate, at the UN General Assembly in September of 2015. So solar's relevant to a whole bunch of those, you know, right through from poverty alleviation to education of women um, and the whole, that whole link with the population problem, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, do you personally think that we'll reach the two degree target? Look, I'm cautiously optimistic. That's all, I, you know, hope lives. I get out of bed with a spring in my step every morning. I, I haven't always been like this. I, you know, until late 2013, I was pretty gloomy. But you know, some things happening uh, right across the whole theater of war. And so hope lives, we have a chance. Thanks, um, that was inspiring after a year. Grim news. Um, so um, the one thing you didn't address was air travel. And like while we see a lot of companies that are just running away with solar companies and Tesla and various other car companies bringing out electric cars, what do you see in terms of startups for addressing air pollution from airplanes? And yeah, well, I mean, it's one of the most intractable problems, of course, for obvious reasons. But um, given the pace of some of the things we're seeing in the digital world, you know, the innovation across the whole uh, space on the ground. I don't think we should give up on, on that e either. I mean, you, you probably uh, have seen people arguing now that battery aircraft m may come in within a few decades, just for, for short haul, not for long haul, but for short haul. So, um, and then there's biofuels, a lot of them are playing around with biofuels. And once again, um, I didn't mention this, but after Paris, there have been two more treaties they've signed, all these diplomats, because they're on a bit of a roll, forgive me if you know all this, but um, they, they signed one on HFCs, which they've been dicking around with for a heck of a long time, and then one on, um, on the air, air sector, and all the airlines signed a, a, a treaty with, it's not very strong, but you know, it's sort of got a process and 200 um, yeah, I mean, that, that too, I think, is consistent with the general theme. <laughs> um, most of us work in, in you know, making solar cheaper, cheaper and a more viable solution still. And um, would you agree that, that having solar being, you know, really, being really cost competitive now makes also politically maybe the crucial or gives a crucial opportunity for politicians to actually come together and say, now we have an opportunity to actually move ahead and not just say, well, we have to we have to be good and, and, and face off. Yeah, absolutely. So the, um, you know, the whole academic community in multiple countries who have spawned this um, cost down in industry. I mean, obviously it's alumni who go and do all that for the most part 
and you've got any number of them out of this school, yeah, so everyone should feel really good about, about that. And I think you see uh, um, in, in governments, you, you see obviously this appreciation of working with the grain uh, and more and more talk about, you know, this is the way we solve social problems. We get people back to work, we clean up the air, we clean up this. Uh, you know, the, the, the economies of the future are going to be based on all this stuff, with solar as a kind of backbone. More and more politicians getting it in multiple countries, including conservative politicians. Not enough of them yet, but, you know, we all need to work on it. Um, so, yeah, well done. Sorry for that. Um, I, the last time I saw you speak, Jeremy, was just before the Paris um, Agreement. And I was just wondering, um, to what extent did the election of Trump take the wind out of your sails? Um, <coughs> realistically, what's the worst case scenario for the damage that he could do to that momentum that you described? Well, hopefully, you know, you, it's clear from the talk. I, it's obviously a setback, and there the are things that the guy can do that will be really damaging. But um, it's a great drama. I mean, is the guy even going to stay out of jail in the next year? Uh, you know, so I'm not going to get too depressed. I'll tell you what did depress me more, and that was Brexit. And, uh, you know, I, um, I was very depressed for a few days after that vote. Um, simply because the thing that got me about it, and it's the same in multiple countries, is you can just, if you're a business person, right, you, you tell one lie to your shareholders, you can go to jail, and probably should, if it's a big enough whopper. Um, but, you know, those guys, Johnson, Farage, and all those people, they were on national television every night telling whopping lies, which, you know, subsequently we've, <laughs> we've now seen uh, uh, whopping lies. They must have known this to some degree. And there's no way of recompense or, or blowback at all. And they achieve their objectives. They whip people up into a state of, you know, hatred, race, racial hatred, and all the rest of it. That was really depressing. And we have to get to grips with that. And the whole inequality piece, um, yeah, that's another form of civil war. I've got to go one more question. I'm sorry, we're running out of time. But on the topic of war, in terms of the Paris Agreement, if there are, um, say, one or a few countries that dishonour their obligations, do you see any chance of like, trade sanctions or anything in terms of putting pressure on? I'd really, I'd really doubt that. I think that, um, you know, these things are legally, legally binding. The ratchet mechanism is legally binding. You know, normally you can go to the international legal process, but at some point you have to have the faith, and I, I believe, having seen these negotiations close to, governments do take it very seriously when they take on commitments. And it's, you know, they, they don't want to wind up in a situation where obviously everyone else is moving on a set of targets, um, and they're not. And they're accused of, you know, breaking the terms of the treaty or lagging behind. So there's sort of really strong peer pressure and I believe if you see that uh, in, the, in the departments that are involved in the, in, in the climate treaty, you see in multiple countries how seriously people are taking this and getting it into the fabric of national legislation and policy making. And okay, it's not enough. It won't get us to two degrees as it stands. That's where the ratchet is important. But um, yeah, it's, it's a confidence building process that, that is important. I don't think anyone will be going in for big sanctions if there are any foot draggers. They certainly won't be declaring war over, um, you know, one nation burning too much coal. <laughs> right, so we will thank uh, Jeremy again for what Thank you for coming. Uh, yeah.